Uh, the reading is taken uh, from the book of Exodus, Exodus chapter 34. Exodus chapter 34, uh, and we'll read uh, the first 10 verses. Exodus chapter 34. The Lord said to Moses, cut for yourself two tablets of stone like the first, and I will write on the tablets the words that were on the first tablets, which you broke. Be ready by the morning and come up in the morning to Mount Sinai and present yourself there to me on the top of the mountain. No one shall come up with you and let no one be seen throughout all the mountain. Let no flocks or herds graze opposite that mountain. So Moses cut two tablets of stone like the first, and he rose early in the morning and went up on Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him, and took in his hands two tablets of stone. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. And Moses quickly bowed his head toward the earth and worshipped. And he said, If now I have found favour in your sight, O Lord, please let the Lord go in the midst of us, For it is a stiff-necked people, and pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us for your inheritance. And he said, Behold, I am making a covenant before all your people. I will do marvels such as have not been created in in all the earth or in any nation. And all the people among whom you are shall see the work of the Lord, for it is an awesome thing that I will do with you. Amen. Thank you very much. Um, can you all hear me? Okay, is my sound on? Great. Yeah, we're all very used to doing this now, aren't we, in our lives? Um, thank you for the invitation to speak. Um, when Fakir uh, contacted me last autumn, we made the arrangement uh, three evenings on Zoom or one day in person. And I don't think really until about four weeks ago either of us knew what it would be. Um, but anyway, either way, it's a, it's a great pleasure to be with you. It was nice to be up there on Friday and to sort of put my feet on Leicestershire soil and to tread the boards at Little Hill and to sort of sort of, you know, I can still feel myself there, even if I'm not there uh, physically. And I don't know why, but fairly quickly, I came to the decision that if I've got three evenings, then I would do three evenings looking at um, Exodus 34, 6 and 7, which I'll read again in a moment, and also uh, looking at how these uh, crucial verses then track through the rest of the Bible. So next week we'll look at some other Old Testament passages, and then God willing in two weeks time we'll look at some New Testament passages as well, looking at how these central verses in our understanding of God um, pan out really in in people's relationships with God. So let me just read to you again these two verses. The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. So even if you didn't believe that these were God's words spoken by him, these words still have to be one of the profoundest statements ever made about the nature of God. Um, But that makes them sound as if they are abstract theology. Now, I spend quite a lot of my working week uh, rubbing shoulders with people who, for some reason, seem to be quite interested in theology. It always baffles me. Um, But the Bible doesn't do abstract theology. 
uh, the theology is always rooted in experience and applied to life. And so that's what I want to look at over the next three weeks. And so I suppose today I'm going to be doing more of the rooted in experience part, how the how this revelation from God came to be given and why in the context of Israel's relationship with him. And then looking at how it then becomes part of their experience of God and how it becomes part of our experience of God. And of course, these verses are these are words spoken at a moment of absolute crisis in Israel's relationship with God. And so they're not really so much a declaration of God's nature, although they are that, but they are more about how he relates to us and how we relate to him. So I want to spend quite a bit of time this evening just looking at the context of how these verses appear. And I'm going to take you to one or two places in Exodus if you have a, a Bible open. So we're going to start in chapter six and try to, to set these verses in context. So in Exodus chapter six, verses six and seven, this is um, God speaking to Moses and through Moses to the people of Israel before he has demonstrated his nature to Pharaoh and and eventually brought the children of Israel, the Israelites, out of Egypt. And he says this, say therefore to the people of Israel, this is Exodus 6 verse 6, I am the Lord and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians and I will deliver you from slavery to them and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. I will take you Know that I am the Lord your God who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. So here there is a promise, first of all, <clears throat> that God will rescue the Israelites from slavery and from genocide, really, if you know the earlier chapters of, of Exodus, and enter into a covenant relationship with them. And that covenant relationship is expressed in what's sometimes referred to as the covenant formula, which is I will be their God. You will be my people. I will be your God. And that's sometimes referred to that expression as the, the covenant formula. And then if we track on into chapter 19, we have some other very well-known words in Exodus 19, verse 6. By this time, God has brought the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt. As he put it, I bore you on eagles' wings, Exodus 19, verse 4. And then in verse six, you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. So this is, again, God uh, reinforcing the idea that they belong to him. And in a sense, he belongs to them. So in theological speak, you hear a lot about the idea of covenant. And probably the best way of understanding what a covenant was in the ancient Near East, not just in Old Testament Israel, is when two parties enter into a family relationship who weren't previously in a family relationship. So um, if a child is born, there doesn't need to be a covenant between that child and his or her parents because they're already in a family relationship. But when a husband and wife come together who are not in a family relationship, then their marriage together is a covenant. Or if you have uh, two people groups, it might be a strong nation like the Assyrians and they enter into a treaty with a lesser nation and they promise to protect them and the lesser nation promises to pay them and, and so on and so on. It's, a, it's a, the establishment of a family relationship where there wasn't one before. And so in the terms of our passage, what that means is that, that God has entered into a family relationship with Israel. He has taken them to be effectively his, his family, a special people, a chosen people out of all the other peoples in the world. So if you can cast your minds back, I don't know how far to, to the last wedding you went to, whenever that might have been, um, 
you might be able to remember that there were some vows exchanged at that wedding, some promises made, some uh, uh, declarations of loyalty and, and faithfulness and so on. And we have exactly the same thing um, at Sinai when God is forging this covenant relationship, this family relationship with his people Israel. And he promises them lots of things. And of course, he promises them land and uh, uh, an expanding population and blessing and fertility of crops and, and so on and so on. And they promise him various things which he lays down. And particularly, of course, when we think of those promises, we think of the, the Ten Commandments. Just So just over in the next chapter of Exodus, we have chapter 20 which gives us the Ten Commandments, but I want to draw your attention particularly to how the, the Ten Commandments begin in Exodus 20, verse 2. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth below or that is in the water under the earth. And this is how the Ten, Ten Commandments begin. So this is, if you like, this, the, the beginning of Israel's wedding vows. So if you keep those words echoing in your minds and you turn forward now to chapter 32, now that seems like quite a lot of chapters, but chronologically it's not very long in time. We're talking about 40 days. Israel is still at Sinai and God is still making this covenant and giving Moses more instructions about the people. Moses has gone up the mountain to meet with God and the people are at the foot of the mountain wondering what's happened to Moses. And so now we turn to Exodus 32 verse 4 and we read this. And he, that is Aaron, received the gold from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made a golden calf. And they said... These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. These are the very same words that God used at the beginning of the Ten Commandments. I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. You must not have any other gods and you mustn't make any idols or images. And here we are within 40 days and we find that the people have not only made an image, but they have actually declared this image to be the God who brought them up out of the land of Egypt. It's absolutely staggering. And I suppose the equivalent of this would be a marriage that goes wrong in the honeymoon. And the question now is, how can this relationship between God and his people be mended after this catastrophic failure on their part? And so then what follows in chapters 32 and 33 and 34 is a sort of negotiation with Moses as the mediator. And so I want to spend just a few minutes looking at this. Because the Lord presents Moses with a couple of um, very unattractive options. The first is scrap it and start again. So the, the, the first thing that God says is, in chapter 32, verse 10, I'm going to scrap this, I'm going to get, destroy this people, and I'll start again, and I'll make a great nation of you, Moses. And Moses, interestingly, in pleading against God doing this, doesn't say, come on, we're not that bad, or give us another chance, or anything of that nature. He just says, this won't reflect well on you if you bring a nation out of Egypt and then slay them in the wilderness. That won't um, reflect well on you and your character. And also remember the covenant you made with the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob and so on. So in other words, the basis of Moses' plea for God not to do this is that's not how you do things. That's not who you are. So then God gives a counter proposal. He says, OK, the compromise solution. And this is at the uh, beginning of chapter 33. He says, I will give the Israelites everything I promised. All, you know, I'll take them into the promised land. I'll drive out the other nations before them. I'll give them the land flowing with milk and honey. 
uh, and I'll bless them with fertility and so on. The only difference is I won't go with you. I won't be in your midst. And I think the really fascinating and heartwarming thing is the way the people respond to this in verse four, chapter 33 and verse four. When the people heard this disastrous word, they mourned and no one put on his ornaments. And I, th I just find this terrific. We can be very hard on the Israelites in chapter 32 and say, what a bunch of idiots. And yet here in chapter 33, they, they're basically told you can have everything you want apart from me. And that's not enough. And I find that quite heartwarming. And then if you look down to verse 13, Moses says, um, consider that this nation is your people. So in other words, Moses is saying it's not about the promises. It's not about the blessings. It's not about the land. It's not about the future, the inheritance. It's about our relationship with you. In other words, that's not who we are. We're not just a bunch of people, freeloaders who are in this to, as a means of getting into the promised land. The relation, fundamental uh, point here is our relationship to you. It's not worth doing this. We might as well die in the wilderness if you are not our God and we are not your people. A couple of other things in this negotiation between Moses and God. The first issue is forgiveness. And in verse 30 of chapter 32, Moses says, I will see if I can somehow make atonement for you. Now, I wonder how you would expect Moses to do that, because you might be thinking, well, this is Old Testament stuff. So as long as he gets enough bulls and rams and goats and kills them in the right way, in the right order, and there's sufficient quantity and there's enough blood sprinkled and splattered around, then there'll be atonement. But none of that is ever in. Nobody mentions sacrifice. And the only thing Moses can do is says, well, if you won't take them, then block me out as well. And it reminds us that there are some things that there is no sacrifice for. And in the Old Testament, there are plenty of laws um, and there are procedures about the sacrifice of animals and, and other things to make atonement. But there are also sins for which no atonement can be made in that way. And in Numbers um, uh, chapter 15, for example, there's, there are laws about people who sin with a high hand. And it says there's no, there's no sacrifice to cover this. So I think it's very important and interesting that even in Israel's perception at this point, it was not, it was, their religion was never a religion of if you kill enough animals, you'll get away with things. It's not about that at all. Moses knows that the only basis for forgiveness is in the nature of God himself. And God says this, he says, I'm not going to block you out, Moses. I, I will punish the one who deserves to be punished. In other words, God is saying, I'm not a bloodletting God. This isn't a case of a sort of vendetta. And if you kill enough people, then I'll be happy. It's not about that at all. There is a, an issue of justice here that needs to be satisfied. So that's the issue of forgiveness, which we'll come back to in a minute. And then, and then finally, there's the question of identity, because sure as, as anything, if a relationship is in crisis, that's the point at which you find out who people really are. And Moses here by the time we get to towards the end of chapter 33, and he has some reassurance from God that God will go with them and take them into the promised land. And then Moses says, now tell me who you are. I want to know who's going with us. And that's the background to this incredible revelation that God gives in Exodus 34, 6 and 7. Those two verses I read at the beginning. This declaration of God's character. So that's the context. We come to the verses themselves and then some application and maybe some practical uh, consequences. So we have this amazing list here of characteristics of God, gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness and so on. And of course, it would be very easy to preach a series of seven sermons or something on e one sermon on each of these characteristics, but I don't think that's how we're meant to take it at all. We're not meant to deconstruct this. We're meant to see it as a whole. And there are certain things. 
first of all, these terms are terms of covenantal loyalty, particularly the two words love and faithfulness. Uh, here they are um, translated love, love and faithfulness in the ESV. And whenever you find these two particular words together, and you find them many times together throughout the Old Testament, you can be sure that what's in the mind of the person speaking is Exodus 34, 6 and 7. And these two words mean um, a, a loyal love of the kind that you commit and bind yourself to, like in a marriage ceremony, that remains true even after death. And so this is the kind of love and faithfulness which meant that David had to seek out a living relative of Jonathan. He'd entered into a covenant with Jonathan and Jonathan had said, show me this faithful love like the love of the Lord. And that meant that David, have to, after Jonathan had died, he had to seek out one of Jonathan's children in order to show this to him because he was bound by his commitment of love and faithfulness and reliability. So they, these are covenant loyalty terms. The second thing you can't help but notice is that they are also terms of sympathetic partiality. So this is a bit like a parent who lets his children get away with things. I know I perhaps shouldn't use those terms, but God is laying on with a trowel the, the terms of forgiveness, uh, being slow to anger, uh, forgiving iniquity, transgression and sin. He's a God predisposed to forgive. And this is why at the end of the service, we're going to sing a hymn based on Psalm 103. And um, you don't need to turn to this now, but if you read the central section of Psalm 103 from verse 7 onwards, you discover that the psalmist here is doing Exodus 34, 6 and 7. So he starts, um, he made, he's made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the people of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He's quoting Exodus 34, 6 and 7. But then he goes on. He doesn't deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. And so he goes on. And then verse 13, as a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. So the psalmist here is meditating on these wonderful words in Exodus 34 and expounding them and saying, you know, well, it, it's a it's a very parental fatherly attitude that God has towards his people. And then finally, these are also terms of justice. So God is no pushover and God is not just a God who lets things go. There has to be justice. And the interesting thing is that from this point onwards, throughout the Old Testament, it is never explained how God can be simultaneously a God of forgiveness and compassion and also a God of justice. Those two things are held in tension throughout the Old Testament, but never the, the relationship between them is never explained until we get to the cross. But I'll say more about that in another, in another week. So then what has God given Moses? He has given him a basis to plead with him. He has given him his character. And immediately Moses pleads it. So verse eight of it, back in Exodus 34 now, Moses quickly bowed his head towards the earth and worshipped. And he said, if now I've found favour in your sight, O Lord, please let the Lord go in the midst of us. For it's a stiff necked people and pardoners our iniquity and our sin and take us for your inheritance. In other words, this is Moses doesn't sit back and say, well, you know, that's a really profound statement of, uh, of an abstract theological nature about about the, the, the character of God. He realises that God is not giving him an abstract statement like that. He's giving him a basis on which to plead with him and the basis on which the relationship can be renewed. And immediately after that, we have the covenant renewal passage. We find exactly the same thing. I won't turn to it now for the sake of time. In Numbers 14, 
you can look at it up look it up afterwards numbers 14 where israel the the israelites refuse to go into the promised land you know the spies go in 10 come back and say oh it's too difficult to come back and say no we should go the lord is with us and the israelites refuse and at that point moses has to intercede for the israelites again read it he quotes these words back to god this is what you are like this is why i know I have a basis on which to expect you to forgive me because you've told me that this is your nature. So then quickly, some application. If I approach God, what can I expect? And more to the point, how can I know what to expect? And this passage teaches us a few things or reminds us of a few things that we know very well anyway. The first, of course, is that God doesn't need us any more than he needed Israel. But that God is not a God who gives up. So the second thing is that we must approach God relationally, not approaching God as a provider of goods and services. So, yes, God is the provider. But we were made for more than simply to live in a world in which the rain falls and the sun shines on the righteous and the unrighteous alike. Sometimes I use the illustration that. How, how we might approach an MP or a GP. You go because you have a need and you don't expect to have a particularly close relationship necessarily with an MP or a GP. And probably after you've left, the GP will instantly forget you. And um, if they happen to remember you walking down the street, all they will remember is your ailment. It's a good job there aren't any GPs present, isn't it? But the, the point is, that's not what we were made for, that kind of relationship with God. I'll go through life, I will enjoy the benefits, and maybe I'll call him if there's a problem. That's a sort of transactional model of our relationship with God. And all of this in Exodus 32 to 34 is all about relationship with God, isn't it? And when we think about salvation, it's too easy to think of it as an impersonal legal process. Um, and of course, there is a legal element to just justification is a legal term, but we must never lose this relational element. We must never lose the, the idea that Moses pleads with God on the basis of who God is, and he lets God take care of the details as exactly how this is transacted and how a sinner can be justified and forgiven. And of course, these passages remind us that we bring nothing to the table. We have nothing to plead except God's character. And throughout these chapters, Moses never pleads anything on the basis of his merit or the merits of the people of Israel. It is all about grace. And it saddens me sometimes when I hear that pe hear people saying that Sinai was a covenant of works and it was all about works righteousness. It's not. These chapters show us that right from the outset, it's about grace. It's about God's undeserved favour to the people that he chose and the people with whom he persisted and remained loyal even in the face of their disloyalty. So then I've got two minutes to talk about some practical consequences as I see it. So the thing that interests me about this, one of the things anyway, is that God is not a scrap it and start it again God. He's a redeeming God. God's desire is to see through what he has begun. However much people may um, mess things up, God is not a sort of um, throw it in the waste bin and start again sort of God. He's a redeeming God. And we see this, of course, in, in the person of the Lord Jesus who came into this world and he said, you know, what? I'll find the lost and I will look for the bruised reeds and the smoking flaxes and I've come for the sinners and I've come for the, the sick. And I've come to, to, to mend and to remake and to redeem those people, not just to look for the promising candidates. And I find this interesting because as a Western society, we're starting to realise that a sort of throwaway approach to life is unsustainable. And we understand that when it comes to the Earth's resources. But the same is true, if not more so, in relationships. And... So we praise God that he is a redeeming God and he's not a scrap it and start it again God. 
and therefore we should not be scrap it and start it again people either we should be those who as much as it depends on us persevere and remain loyal in our relationships with other people and so this leads me on to reflect that that god is perfect but nobody else is and our reality is of flawed failing image bearers and again i think our society is very quick to judge we incredibly moralistic and judgmental and self-righteous um, as a society and it's one strike and out very often for people in certain professions anyway and i think we shouldn't be expecting perfection from people yes okay if people make mistakes and do things that are wrong they should be held to account for that yes of course i agree with all that but i think as christians we ought to show ourselves more tolerant and a bit more understanding and look at these chapters particularly and see ourselves as the Israelites and recognize well but for the grace of God where would we be and therefore I can afford to be a little bit more generous perhaps towards other people a bit more tolerant of their mistakes a bit more open about my own failings perhaps so in other words a passage like this teaches us that we should have no illusions about ourselves because we have security in God's character. No illusions about ourselves because our, our strength and our confidence and our ability to stand up and look ourselves in the mirror in the morning is not based on who we are. It's based on who, how God sees us and how God values us. And his nature and character is the rock on which we build our lives. Let's pray then. Almighty God, we thank you for the incomparable privilege that you have revealed to us the truth about yourself and your nature, not just as a proposition or a, a truth about who you are, but as the basis on which we can relate to you. We thank you that when we put our faith in the Lord Jesus, we can experience you truly to be this God who is gracious and compassionate, full of mercy and forgiveness, the one who is indulgent like a, a loving father, the one who deals with our sins and separates us from them as far as east is from west. We thank you that you have given us this truth to live our lives by and we pray that it would give us confidence and security in our relating to you and it would also uh, percolate down into the way that we treat other people and to the way, way that we relate to, relate to others as well. We pray that people would understand something of your nature as it's revealed in Exodus 34, 6 and 7 from the way that we conduct our relationships. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.